Alright, why don't we get started now? Good afternoon, happy Monday. How's everybody doing? Pretty well. I saw a lot of. Eh. But that's exactly the mood I'm going for. I want to really bring that out of you. I want to I want to change that attitude. I want you to walk in here going meh, and I want you to walk out of here going meh. <laughs> I want you to be passionate in your impassion, in your lack of passion. Um, anyway, so uh, yeah, this week we are going to cover a new topic called recursion. That's going to be all week. Exciting, yeah. Uh, just out of curiosity, who here has ever programmed with recursion before? Oh, a lot of you. Cool. Okay, great. Well, it's I don't. I'm not expecting that knowledge. I'm going to start from scratch, so some of it might be review for some of you. But we're still going to do this in kind of an x way. So let's see, what else is going on? You've got homework two that has been posted. It's due this Friday. Keep an eye on that. You're going to have section later this week, all the usual stuff. Our section leaders are currently working on grading your homework one submissions from last Friday, or if you're still working on it or whatever. But uh, usually our goal is to get the homeworks back before you turn in the next homework so that you can get your feedback and stuff like that. Uh, we try our best to meet that deadline, although it's hard. Sometimes we, we uh, slip on our deadlines. We need late days too. But that's going to be our goal to try to get your grades back before the next assignment is due. So, okay, um, let me launch into this new topic. These slides are on the web page. The book chapters of relevance are chapter 7 and 8. Uh, we're starting with chapter 7 here. I will say, even though... You guys are 106X students and you got your giant brains. Um, this may prove to be a hard topic for some of you and that's okay. I want to just confess that when I was a, a wee lad and I was in college and I was learning computer science, I thought CS wasn't too hard. And then when we got to recursion, I thought recursion was kind of tricky. And so I just want you to know that this topic can be challenging. I would say that a lot of people, it just takes them a while to really get it. And once they get it, the problem solutions come quicker to them, but it can sometimes take a while to get to that place. Um, so, I mean, you know, buyer beware. <laughs> You've been warned. Um, but that's okay. You know, we're going to practice a lot. We're going to talk about this topic a lot. Recursion is going to be involved in almost all of the stuff that we do for the rest of this class. So by the end of, you know, by Christmas time, by holiday time, hopefully you'll feel pretty awesome about recursion. Um, we'll see. But again, as I say, if it's not obvious what's going on right away, that's okay. And in fact, all of that is a big excuse if my lecture sucks. Then so don't blame yourself if you don't get it after this lecture, okay? Uh, so here we go. Wait. Why is that slide one? That's not supposed to be slide one. There's a slide missing that's like what recursion is. <laughs> it's like here's the cases you have. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, great. I'm, I don't know what happened. I think I might have deleted a slide on my local copy or something. So, okay, what's recursion? Great, let me, hold on a sec. Uh, I wasn't anticipating this. Uh, okay, here, this is me making ASCII slides. Um, okay. There. Of course, I, I could just go back to the PowerPoint program and click the new slide button, but no. Um, Recursion is when you describe a computing process in terms of itself. So, uh, you know, describing an algorithm or a process in terms of itself. So, what do I mean by that exactly? Um, there are lots of examples, but, you know, you could say, uh, how do you, it's a real world example, um, how do you look up a word in the dictionary to understand its meaning? Well, you, you turn to the page in the dictionary that has that word in it. You read the definition, and then when you read the definition, there might be some words of the definition that you don't understand what they mean, so you go and look those words up, right? But wait, what's looking up a word? Well, you go to that page in the dictionary where that word is defined, and so if, if you understand what I'm trying to say is that I've just described how to look up a word in the dictionary, but in the description of that algorithm, I said that you should go look up a word in the dictionary. So I described that process in terms of itself, okay? Um, <clears throat> so that is an idea that is larger than computing, but we use it in computing. And in fact, when you want to talk about a programming construct, what is recursive programming? I would say it would be writing a function that calls itself. 
a function that calls itself. So uh, <laughs> some students invent recursion without knowing what it is. And they might do it for the right reason or for the wrong reason. Uh, they do it because they don't use a loop properly. They get to the bottom of a function and they say, well, I want to do all of that again. So they call the same function to get back to the top again. So it'll run itself, you know, and they start doing this kind of stuff. <laughs> and really, they should just have like a while loop or something, you know what I mean? So that's kind of bad recursion. It's just using a, a, a self-call as a loop. But better recursion would be to identify a process that is inherently uh, this, this style that works well with this style. So I would say the recursion works well with problems that are what I will call self-similar, okay? So a self-similar problem is that uh, in order to solve this problem, it would be helpful if you could solve a modified version of that same problem. So I think a kind of bad example that everybody gives first is they talk about factorial. Factorial of n, you know, we know this uh, mathematical definition, right? It's the product of all the integers from 1 through n, right? So, I mean, if you're going to write a factorial function, you would probably write a for loop that goes 1, 2, 3, up to n, and it multiplies into a variable that you're accumulating or something like that, right? So you would probably say something like, uh, you know, in fact, in n, you say, uh, you know, int result equals 1, for int i equals 1 or 2, whatever, i is less than or equal to n, i plus plus, result times equals i, and then you say return result, right? Something like that, yeah? Okay, so that is a normal version of a factorial function. Or you might call it an iterative version of a factorial function. So the recursive idea of factorial is often, I mean, the, the recursive version of any algorithm often removes loops from the equation. And recursion is a computational mechanism that can allow for repetition without looping. It's kind of interesting. So <clears throat> how do you write a solution to factorial that doesn't have a loop in it? Well, if you think about the mathematical definition of factorial that you might see in a textbook, a lot of times when they write these things out, they say, well, it's equal to blank if n equals something, but it's equal to, you know, some other thing if n equals something else. And so you kind of describe out these cases, you know, they have like the sideways big tall curly brace that says it becomes this or this or this or this. It's kind of like a case analysis of what a factorial is. So what are the different cases of a factorial? Well, what is the simplest thing to make a factorial of? If, factor, if it's one, then what's the factorial of that? One. And actually, uh, if n equals zero or one, then that's the case also, right? A factorial of zero is also one. But then what is the um, factorial of things that are not zero or one? I mean, I don't, I don't want to write out one times two times dot, dot, dot times n. I don't want to really write it out that way. Usually, we describe these things in a self-similar way. If, I'm, if I ask for the factorial of something else, how could that help me find the factorial of n? Well, uh, I think the way to think recursively is to say, well, OK, I can't just write it equals the factorial of n, because that's too circular, right? The factorial of n, arrow, the factorial of n, done. That's too, uh, that's too circular. But if I were allowed to say any other factorial other than n, if that were legal, then how could that help me to write a solid definition for this thing? What, what other factorial could I use in this definition? The factorial of n minus 1, then what? Times n, right? If, if n is uh, greater than 1. So <clears throat> if you're allowed to do this, then you can write code that has that same structure. So, so a recursive version of this factorial would be if n equals 0, I guess to match exactly what we wrote, I could say or n equals 1 then return one. That's the sort of simplest version. Else, if it's greater than one, we return the factorial of n minus one times n. That is a recursive version of the factorial function. It calls itself. It calls itself. So <clears throat> if I ask for what's the factorial of uh, five, let's do four. <laughs> then it doesn't go into the if because it isn't 0 or 1. So what that does is it says return 
uh, the factorial of 3 times 4, right? Okay, well, what does the factorial of 3 do? It uh, says return uh, the factorial of 2 times 3, right? And what does factorial of 2 do? It says return the factorial of 1 times 2. And the factorial of 1 just says return 1, right? So where does the 1 return back to? It returns back to here, right? So that means return 1 times 2, yeah? And so 1 times 2 returns back to here. So 1 times 2 is just 2. So this one is 2 times 3. That returns back to here. 2 times 3, 6. 6 times 4 returns back to here. That's what gets sent out from the overall function. So the result that gets sent back to the caller is 24. 6 times 4, which I think is the factorial of, of 4. So that's the basic idea of how recursion works, OK? Um, this code could be improved a little bit just in terms of the logic and the ifs and the elses and stuff. Uh, there's a small piece of code that's not necessary. Do you know what I'm referring to? If you delete the n equals 1, it still works. And the reason is because if you come back to here, actually, let me undo the simplifying that I did down here. Uh, if I delete this, then this piece of code changes at the bottom here. Oh, sorry. Uh, trying to fit everything on the screen here so you can see it. So down here where it says return 1, instead of that, factorial of 1 is not a simple uh, if anymore. It falls into the else, right? So I would say return fact of 0 times 1. And fact of 0 is 1. So 1 times 1. It just it calls one more call, but it uh, returns the same thing all the way back out. So you might say, well, but I like the other one better because uh, it doesn't have as many calls or whatever. But I mean, taking a time to test it if and an or every time is slow too. So I actually think the cleaner version of the code with fewer ifs and else's and ors is the better version here. Um, so that is a recursive recursive version of the factorial function. How am I doing with no slides so far? <laughs> I don't know where my slides went. I must have, uh, must some sort of cat or dog probably jumped on the delete key here, but um, how are we doing so far? Questions, yeah. What if you do n is less than two? Oh, uh, here, like if n less than two, return n? Return one. Well, but two factorial, oh, less than two. Yeah, you could do that, that'd be fine. Sure. Okay. Bless you. You could do you could technically do if less than or equal to two return n, I think. Because two returns Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I I'm sorry, I didn't mean to uh, you know, uh, do erasure of zero. Zero counts too. Hashtag zero lives matter. Um what? Okay. Uh, question, yeah. Oh, question mark colon? I could, yeah, I could say return this question mark one colon that. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, I, I've seen it mostly written with if else. I think sort of when we're learning recursion, it's a, a sort of a nice <coughs> template to have an if and an else as kind of the, the way to do this. I want to talk more about this code structure in a minute. I just kind of wanted to blast out one quick um, example before we kept going. Yeah, back. Yep. Uh, is there an issue with like when all the returns stack up? Right, so that's kind of a 106 XE, 106 XE kind of a question. Like, will this um, be too much memory stacking up on that call stack if I have a lot of calls and stuff? Uh, you also mentioned another issue where multiplying all these ints together will, will pretty quickly overflow the range that an int can store. Yes, that's also a problem. Both of those are important things to think about. Um, what I will say is, uh, to some degree, I want to detach the discussion of these concepts from some C++ implementation details of those concepts. So for example, yes, if I make a whole bunch of recursive calls, at some point I run out of call stack memory, my program would eventually crash with a stack overflow uh, error, yes. And that is a problem that wouldn't happen with a for loop solution. So that's an issue. Also the integer overflow thing is an issue. I will say there are other programming languages that have optimizations built into them that will avoid that sort of issue. 
that won't crash your program if you have a lot of recursive calls. They'll handle it more elegantly. C++ is not such a language, but you know, if I want to teach you this, we're going to have that issue. Hopefully, I won't give you any exercises that would run up against such a limit. I won't. I mean, I wouldn't want to use recursion in a case like that. Yeah. Um, and then also, why is this better than just iterating over? Limits? Oh, that's a great question. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> the question is sort of like. Why should I care about this crap? This looks harder than the, the for loop was great. Why did you take away my for loop, Marty? Um, yeah, and, and I mean, I, I know you're asking that for the right reason. Like, sometimes I get students asking me that, and the underlying reason is like, I don't want to learn new things, you know? For loops are great. I don't want to have to think about things in a different way. And I know that all of you are 106x type of people, and so you like learning new stuff. And so it's really more about like, why I want to choose the best way to solve a problem and so this seems like the less best way to solve this problem, so why should I choose this? That's more the motivation there, I think, or at least I hope that's, <laughs> I hope that's why you're asking that question. And so I will confess to you that this is slower to run the solution to this problem than the for loop is. It's strictly a worse solution if you're gonna talk about performance. I'm using this as an example to illustrate uh, the idea. And I concede that this is not a great example to use recursion. I want to talk about the mechanics of it and how it works here with simple things like ints. I think where recursion is more interesting is that there are problems that are more in, bless you, there are problems that are more inherently recursive, like search a directory tree for a file, but then also search the directory trees underneath the directory tree, underneath the directory tree. That's recursive. Or, um, you know, escape from a maze. And if you get stuck over here, escape from there. And if you get stuck over here, escape from there. And there's kind of a recursion to escaping from a maze. Find all the anagrams of your name. Well, how do you do that? Well, you find all the anagrams of this word, and then you recursively find all the anagrams of that word. There are algorithms that are, are beautifully self-similar that we will use recursion to solve. This is not one of those algorithms. However, if I jump straight to those algorithms, it's easy to get lost in the complexity of the code. This is such a simple piece of code. I want to make sure we understand it before I dive into harder stuff. Okay. What else? Any other questions? There were some other hands up, but I don't know if they, their question got answered already. I think we're getting to the place where my slides resume. Uh, let's see. So I think we can go here now. Usually when you write recursive code, your code has two or more cases, like if versus else. One of those cases is called a base case which means this is a simple version of this problem. I can solve it directly. I don't need to use any recursion right now. So in our factorial, that was the n is zero or the n is one. I just know what the answer to that is. Here's the answer. There's also maybe what's called a recursive case, a more complicated case where I don't know the answer right away. I'm gonna make a recursive call to help me figure out the answer. Usually the recursive call is a sort of a smaller version of the same problem. If I'm processing an a int, I chip away a little bit out of that int. I reduce the int by one or divide it by two or something. If I'm processing some kind of collection, maybe I slice some of the elements out and use recursion to look at the rest of the elements, uh, et cetera. So it's an important idea that if you're gonna write a recursive solution to a problem, you want each of the recursive calls to handle a small part of solving the problem. And it depends what I mean by that. It depends on what the problem is. Like if I'm, if I'm searching for something, maybe each call searches a small part of the searching space. If I'm calculating something, a sum, a factorial, or whatever, maybe each call calculates one term of that uh, expression. Okay, so each call tackles a small part of the work. Uh, I've also, I've heard this other example that sometimes they use with, with kids. Like if they show recursion to um, eighth graders or something. They, they give them a giant bowl of uh, candies, like M&Ms or something. And they say, uh, if, if you can, uh, and they, so they give you a giant bag of M&Ms that has some number of M&Ms in it. And they also give them a separate bag, which is like a supply pile of, of infinitely more M&Ms, okay? And the, and, the, and the idea is, how do you double the number of M&Ms in the bowl? But you're not allowed to count. You're not allowed to count. You can all work together, but you're not allowed to count. So what you have is a bowl that has n M&Ms in it for some n. I want it to have 2n. I've got an infinite supply more that I can put into the bowl, but I don't know how many to put because I don't know what the value n is, and it's big enough I can't just look at it, and I'm not allowed to just count, I, or I can't count in the case of some school districts. I don't know. Um, <laughs> 
Well, you know, Berkeley area, you know. <laughs> oh, I'm just kidding. Uh, so, so like, you know, then you ask all these kids, like, how do you do it, you know? And, and then, then you remind them, like, hey, you can work together. Even though you can't count, you all can work together. And so you try to get them to come up with an algorithm where each kid helps a little bit with doubling the M&Ms in the bowl. Anybody got any ideas? Eighth graders can figure this out, can you? How would you help a little bit with doubling the number of M&Ms in the bowl? What would you say, sir? I mean, you could give half of them to one kid, half of them to the other, and give half those kids, give half of theirs to one kid, half of theirs to another. Okay, split it in half. It's an interesting idea. The problem is I don't know how many is half of the M&Ms. There's a whole bunch in the bowl. It's like you're kind of eyeball. eyeball. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think... Well, no, but it's, it's, I think a lot of algorithms bump up against something like that where you say, well, you grab 50 of them and I'll grab 100, and you say, well, I can't count to 50. You know, I, I maybe could keep track of a, a small number, but I can't like, count, count, count up to 10 or 100,000. Yes, sir? Take an M&M and then take another one. Take an M&M and take one from the, the, the infinite supply, and then what do I do with them? Eat them. Screw your game. What about Have everybody do that? And then what? Now we all are holding our M&M plus a supply M&M. And now once there's nothing left in the bowl, have everybody who's holding those two M&Ms put them back. Now there's twice as many, right? We all work together, fictionally. You guys are probably pissed off because I didn't bring you any fucking M&Ms, right? <laughs> A good teacher would have done this game and brought the M&M's. I don't give a shit. I'm not bringing any M&M's. No. You can think about M&M's. You can think about how much M&M's you wish you had. Um, yeah, that's the great idea. That's, that's how you do it. Um, every kid does a little piece of solving the problem. I just grab one M&M and I grab a, um, a, a supply M&M. &M that's all I do. And then I pass it on to somebody else to help with the rest. However, so one other thing to remember is all of us kids working together, we're all following the same algorithm as each other. If you took me and moved me over there and you took her and you moved her over there, the algorithm's still the same. We're not each following special instructions. You're the fourth person, so you do this, and you're the 17th person, so you do that. We're all kind of equal little worker bees working together, right? We are the calls of the recursive function. If bowl is, uh, has M&Ms in it, take M&M, take M&M, pass bowl. Recursion usually has those two cases, right? So what's the other case? If there's no M&Ms, no &M. no then I don't do anything. I just give it back or whatever. We start passing it back the way it came. And then eventually, when it gets back to the first person who started the whole thing, and they put their two M&Ms back in, we, we stop. We're done, right? So if empty, pass back. Else, take, take, pass, wait, put, put, pass, something like that. You know, um, That's the idea. It's, it's a self-similar problem. And, and actually, I want to mention that again. When we talk about recursion, we talk about things that are self-similar, right? So I really like to talk about these solutions in terms of self-similarity. That's a great algorithm that totally solves the problem. But how is the solution that we're using self-similar? Think about it for a second. How is doubling a bowl of M&Ms similar to doubling some other bowl of M&Ms? Well, if I take mine, my one M&M out, and I take my supply M&M out, I know that whatever number of M&Ms there used to be in the bowl, there's one fewer. So if there used to be n, now there are n minus 1, right? I pass it. A bunch of people do a bunch of stuff. Eventually, the bowl comes back to me. I'm counting on the idea that the bowl has changed from having n minus 1 M&Ms in it to having 2 times n minus 1 M&Ms in it, right? 2 n minus 2. So when I put my M&Ms in, that'll bring it up to 2 n. So I went from n to 2 n. So me passing and waiting for it to come back, I'm asking for double the bowl of M&Ms on this new bowl <laughs> that has one fewer. So my algorithm for doubling the bowl involves asking other people to please double the bowl. But the bowl I'm asking them to double is a smaller version of this bowl. Do you understand? I broke the problem down slightly by taking one out. And then, <clears throat> self-similarly, I said, I don't know how to double a bowl of n M&Ms, but I definitely can get some help doubling a bowl of n minus 1 M&Ms. And then I'll do the rest after that. <laughs> so it's deceptively simple what each worker B has to do, what each call of the function, if you will, has to do. Somebody had their hand up. Yeah? If you can understand n minus 1 and do that n minus 1, then you can probably count, right? Well, I mean, if you can understand n minus 1, can you count? 
I guess my point is like, I don't know what n is. I understand the existence of numbers. I just have trouble keeping track of counting up to the numbers, you know? So I have a very specific uh, disability of some kind. Like, <laughs> I don't know. You have to really slice my, uh, my, my mental state in a certain way to get this to work. But, but yeah, hey, it's a, it's a very fictional uh, idea. But OK, so you look for things that are self-similar. You try to write code that has a base case and a recursive case. That's usually the pattern that we see. So there's factorial. I already talked about that. Um, blah, blah, blah. So here's another one. It's a mystery stack trace. If you pass in 648, it takes n over 10 and mod 10, n over 10, 64, and mod 10, 8. So then it calls with mystery of 64 plus 8, 72. So we go up 72. 7 is the division, and 2 is the mod. 7 plus 2, 9. We go up, it's less than 10. Return. So I think the answer here is uh, b9, it returns 9. So this thing is a digit summing mystery function. <coughs> Some of the digits. So there are other mystery problems like this if you want to walk through them and, and see how they work. Um, yeah, so it calls n648, which calls n of 72, which calls n of 9. It returns those answers all the way back out. And I, I sometimes talk about these call stack traces where each time you call the function, it stacks up another copy of the function. I think that's a pretty common misconception students have where they say, oh, you call me with 648, and so I get here, and so that means it jumps up to here. And that's sort of mostly right, but not totally right. Because when you say that you want to call mystery of uh, 72, it doesn't just like jump up here never to return. It actually spawns a new whole copy of the function, and that whole copy starts up here. But I'm still here. I still exist. My first copy still is alive. I'm just waiting for him to return something. Whatever, hey, nice code step by step. When he, uh, <laughs> I plan at that guy in the audience. He's totally a, a paid show. Um, <laughs> when that second call is done, whatever he returns, I will also return. But it's still an important idea that I exist and he exists. Like when he gets called, a second version of him pops up. And he waits for a third version of him that pops up. And when he eventually says he's returning n of 9, where that returns to is not all the way out immediately. It returns to the second guy. The second guy is waiting right here. So the nine gets plopped here, and that returns to the first guy who's waiting right here. And that returns out to the whoever called this uh, in the first place. It's a subtle distinction, but it's an important distinction. Yes? Versus using, say, like the for loop in this case, how much more efficient is recursion? Oh, how much more? How much is the efficiency difference? Um, <clears throat> well, it can be pretty stark because uh, the compiler is really good in C++ at optimizing loops and recursion it isn't good at optimizing. So for these little number problems, you would be kind of sad if you did a benchmark. You'd be like, oh my god, Marty, <laughs> no, <laughs> let's not do this. Um, but again, like, I, think, I think if, you, um, if you're looking at like, a couple of function calls like this, that's not so bad. If you're looking at like a thousand function calls, a million function calls, that's bad. So we'll try to avoid recursion if we're going to be doing that many calls. Um, but usually it's not that many. Okay, uh, another fun, another question. Uh, yeah. But does uh, the process of making uh, the copied version um, of the function each time uh, use um, uh, use up use up more memory uh, than if you I did like a loop or something. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, well, I yeah. mean, each one of these function call stack frames does use a little bit of memory to remember the memory address to jump around to and the parameter values and stuff. It's not a ton of memory, it's just a, a few tens of bytes or something, oh. but it is some. So there is a little bit of memory getting used. I would say don't worry about it too much because we're not talking about like a giant grid that's getting copied or whatever. We're talking about, you know, 64 bytes or something like that. Yeah. Can you talk about things like briefly like tail call optimization or how a functional language might make recursion more efficient? Um, yeah, I'm going to talk about that, about optimizing recursion. I mean, it's kind of underneath us. It's like if you, if you use the right languages and tools, and sometimes depending how you structure your code, you can get to a state where the compiler can run this stuff real, real, real fast. In fact, this function here would run very fast in some languages and would not have any memory overheads and that kind of stuff because the compiler would optimize stuff. 
since it happens underneath us, I mostly won't talk a lot about it, but I will mention it at some points while we're talking about recursion. Um, okay, so let's do more. I just, I really think the best way to get good at this is to practice, practice, practice. I encourage you to use tools like Step by Step and just look at problems in the book. Uh, go practice recursion. You get better at it the more you practice it. Let's write a power function that computes a base to an exponent. We're not allowed to use any loops. Okay, so let's go to um, Qt Creator. I'm going to write the power function. Okay, so base to an exponent, like it says pow, but it should say power. Power 3, comma 4, returns 3 to the fourth, which is 81. How is computing a power similar to computing a power? How is it self similar? Yes? So it's almost like we're looping, multiplying by the base over and over and over and over, right? Good. So. How do I do that without a loop? And again, let's think about like how is it self-similar? What's a small portion of the computation that each call could sort of chip off of the overall task? Like, how do we get closer to the answer without computing the whole answer? Um, yeah. For like the number, if we want to compute x to the n, it's the same thing as x times x to the n minus one. Okay. Yeah. 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 So, so you're saying like. Uh, power of 3 to the 4th is equal to 3 times power of 3 to the 3rd, which is equal to 3 times 3 times power of 3 to the 2nd, and so on, right? Okay, when do I get to stop this dance? 3 to the 1 is 3. I could, I could go even simpler than that, right? 3 to the 0 is 1. So, I mean, yeah, basically you can say if the exponent is 0, then anything to the zero is one, right? Re sorry, I can't type return one. Sometimes I'll write base case or something just to remember. You guys said, well, if the exponent is one, I could return the base. It's also a base case, no pun intended, um, <laughs> right? <laughs> Else, no. Nah. Well, you guys don't like my recursive jokes today. Do you? <laughs> well, if you want a recursion joke, um, the first thing you need to learn to understand recursion is to understand recursion, right? I know. I know. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, okay. Uh, else, if the if the exponent is not zero or one, we just do this up here. What you guys said. So return the base times the power of base to the x minus one, right? Got it. Um, I think. Now, this code could be a little bit simpler. I could actually eliminate one of the cases. You know which one? The exponent equals one case, because if you just think about it for a second, if you say that you want three to the first, right now that goes here, so it returns three, right? Okay, but if you delete this case, it's either zero or recursive, then if you say three to the one, it won't be the base case, it'll be this case. So it'll return three times three to the zero. And three to the zero is one, so it'll be three times one, it'll be three, it'll return the same answer, actually. It will require one more recursive call, but I don't want to micromanage the that efficiency aspect. Um, oops, uh, somebody had their, their hand up, yeah? Are there any sort of real world tasks that require more than one base case? Require more than one base case? Yeah, because like, usually you can kind of reduce it to one. I mean, I'm sure you can invent a contrived problem where you need it, but there are any common There are, in fact, I'm, um, I'm gonna show you examples where uh, sometimes we handle certain cases by throwing exceptions. Um, there's also cases where like if it's even versus if it's odd at the base, you do different stuff. So there's definitely examples. Or, or like we're going to do one where we compute uh, palindromes. And sometimes depending if you, if you shrink a string down, if they match or not, you do different things. And so, yeah, there's definitely cases where you have more than one base case. No, wait, why is my, it says it can't build recursion dot, oh, wait, what's going on here? Um, let me think, why is this happening? It says multiple main, but do I have some kind of include problem here? I don't have more than one main. I compiled this earlier. Multiple definition. It thinks I have more than one. Do I have some sort of like? Could you include yourself by accident? Yeah, I'm wondering if I. I, I <laughs> <laughs> hey, if I include in recursion.cpp, whoa! <laughs> I'm just not clever enough for that sort of thing. Um, 
Yeah, I wonder if I, so if I search for main, no, I've only got one. Uh, so wait, what did I do here? Huh, let me think, why is that happening? Do I have a, I have a recursion age, wait. Uh, hold on a sec. Boy, today's really my day. All my equipment's working, my slides are working. Uh, I just have a hunch, let's go recursion probs.cpp. So I'm definitely having some recursion problems right now. So let's reload that. I'm going to recompile. And recursion probs, compile. Let's see if it works. Yeah, where were we? So we're doing power. Power base exp. And where is that? Here. So now we get to watch the Stanford Library compile itself, which is always a great time. Tell us a story. Tell you a story? Do you want to see a puppy photo? Yes! I know how to fill the dead time, don't I? Um, here you go. These are my dogs outside in the yard this morning. That's Abby right there, and that's Clyde right there, and that's Barney right there. Now you see there's one, two beds with three dogs in them, right? So you might say, where's the third bed? Well, I'll tell you, they dragged it around the corner over there, and it got all dirty. And no matter how many times I bring this bed back over, they always drag it away. And I'm convinced that they want there to only be two beds so that somebody has to snuggle with somebody. <laughs> or maybe they just like tearing apart beds. I don't know. <laughs> it's one of the two. OK, now you've seen a blurry photo. Alphabetically, Abby, Barney, Clyde. Yeah. <laughs> And so actually, I kept telling my wife we should name our daughter something with a D, you know, like <laughs> Doreen or whatever, and then Edward for our next story, like, it'll be great. She's like, are you really proposing naming our animals and our children in sync? And I was like, well. <laughs> Sorry, did somebody have their hand up? Or was it a puppy question? Hey, it compiled. Did you see that? Look, it compiled. That was great. Puppy photos save everything. Uh, OK, so it's mostly working, I think. Uh, three to the four. These look pretty good. Um, I have some negative numbers here where it's not doing the right thing. Um, Sorry, what? That's right. Well, negative four to the zero is, is one, but um, don't I have some other tests of negative? Sorry, I, I'm not trying to say negative four to the zero isn't one. I just meant. Uh, what if I do like uh, uh, right negative four to the third? Yeah, so I want to talk about these different cases here. So, uh oh, system problem. Wow. Uh, so actually, negative four to the third, that one worked fine because it just multiplied negative four times itself three times. But then when I tried to do five to the negative three, it actually unexpectedly finished. I encourage you, if you decide you want to break up with your boyfriend or girlfriend, just be like, this relationship has unexpectedly finished. So OK, this one crashed, though. So why did this one crash? I, I passed 5 as the base, and negative 3 is the exponent. Um, let's look at our code again. Why would negative 3 exponent um, do bad things here? Yeah, negative 3 isn't 0, so it calls whatever times pow to the negative 4. Negative 4 isn't 0, so it passes negative 5. Oh, no, I'm spiraling into a not totally infinite, but basically infinite recursion. Technically, if I keep decreasing an int, I will eventually underflow to the maximum possible positive. Why didn't it do that? Uh, what's that? Why didn't it do that? Sorry. Why didn't it do that? Well, because it ran out of memory before it got to <laughs> negative 2 billion or whatever. It couldn't do 2 billion calls worth. Um, so this was a stack overflow error. That's unfortunate. So what should we do? Well, you could just say, uh, I assume you pass an exponent that is at least 0. So therefore, if you don't do that, then it's your problem. Um, <laughs> That's one way of doing that. But it, this isn't a very good uh, experience for the program to unexpectedly finish with no real message about what's going on. So what a lot of times what we'll do is we'll say, well, if the exponent is less than 0, so what should we do? We could do C out, hey, stupid, that's not right, or whatever. Um, that's not usually what we do. Um, in, in a lot of languages, you can sort of raise an error or throw an exception or something like that to indicate that your function is being called in an illegal way. In C++, you can throw things. Throwing means cause an error to occur. 
Um, in Java, you say something like throw new illegal argument exception or whatever. You know, you, you do something like that. In C++, the convention is to, uh, if the caller passes you a value that you don't like, the convention is to throw that value back at them. <laughs> Here's your exponent. Ah, take it. Take it back. Um, <laughs> Negative three now. <laughs> um, so uh, what does it do now? Um, it says an int exception occurred, negative three. So that's a little bit better. It has a stack trace. It says line 93 was to blame. And so, oh, okay, if I'm, actually it's off by one, but whatever, it's, it, it uses a pack to figure out the line number, but that's why it says approximate. Um, I tried, I wrote this code, I tried really hard, I got within one line. Um, so this is pretty common. If you have a recursive function and there's a sort of a parameter value that would break everything, you check for it first and you throw exceptions on it. So I guess technically there are two base cases here. The sort of illegal argument base case and the sort of legal smallest version of the problem base case here. Okay? But we definitely will ask you to write recursive functions and we'll say you should throw an int exception if this happens. So what I mean by that is throw some int out of the function if, if this is illegal or whatever. Okay? It still crashes the program. so. You might say, well, but I thought the goal was not to make it crash or whatever. It still crashes, but it crashes in a way that we can track down the, the problem. And crashing isn't bad in general. Uh, this is not an error in my code. This is an error in the person who's calling my code. They should fix their shit. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, so they want to know that their call is bad, that they should fix their call. Um, you might say, well, but they just pass a negative three there. I don't know. It's probably like they prompted the user to type a value and the user typed something wrong. They should be doing if else is on that value before they call my function or something like that. Um, anyway, okay, so that's power. Any questions about that one? Yeah. Do we need to include any special headers to throw exceptions? No, you don't need to include anything. You just, it's part of the language. You can just say throw. There is a heading called error.h that has an error function that throws an exception for you, but I think it's no simpler than this. I think this is fine. Uh, okay, so let's do more. Let's do more. So power. Oh, one thing I want to point out is um, this is basically what we wrote. We, we, we talked about you could do one for exponent equals one, but actually, um, so we the call stack up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So then zero is better than one. That's a better base case. And I think we, we talk about like, really getting it and identifying what cases you need and what cases you don't need. We sometimes call that recursion zen. Like if you really get recursion, you'll say, oh, we do not need an exponent equals one case. I've become enlightened. I see that a zero case will handle it just fine. It's fine. Um, so, you know, that's, that's like an idea. You, you get the hang of that by writing more recursive functions. Um, and I would say the most common unnecessary case people write is a case that's sort of one up from the basest base case. Like they, they don't see the zero, but they write the one case or something like that. That's pretty common. Um, so yeah, we, uh, we talked about how sometimes you make assumptions. We sometimes call those assumptions preconditions. I'm trying to move faster here. Uh, if you violate a precondition, you throw an exception. You can throw any type of value, an int, a string, an object, or whatever. There is also a try catch syntax in C++. I don't want to talk about it today but you can have the other side of the call catch the exception and handle it if they want to do something about it. Um, yeah, so throw negative exponent. You can throw, in this case what I did was I didn't throw the exponent, I threw a string saying you passed me a negative exponent. You can do that too. That gives you a little more descriptive error message either way. Uh, okay, quick optimization. You might notice that when you're doing exponents, you know, if you just say n times power of n minus one, you have to make sort of n calls for the exponent of n. If you want to cut down your number of calls a little bit, some of y'all who are concerned about efficiency, well, you could notice that uh, 3 to the 12th is 3 squared to the 6th, which is 3 to the 4th to the 3rd. You could sort of slice by twos here instead of by just taking one off the top every time. And so um, the way that you could incorporate that into the code is if the exponent that you're dealing with is even, you could, you could handle that, right? So the code for that looks a little bit like this. If the exponent you're calculating is even, then square the base and half the exponent, which is a small optimization, but it actually takes you from having n recursive calls to having a logarithm base two of n number of recursive calls, which as we have discussed previously, logs are better than n's. So that changes the sort of big O, both in terms of time and in terms of memory for this uh, calculation. Yes? Is that how 
how work is actually implemented inside of, I think, math.h? Oh, the actual pow function. No, they would never use recursion. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Uh, the actual pow function doesn't use recursion because this language has inefficient implementation of recursion. So uh, this is still an example that the real guys and gals who do this stuff don't use recursion for this example. But I think we're getting closer. I think this one is an example where the definition of what we're computing is nicely self-similar. So we're getting closer to problems that have that attribute. Um, okay, let me move forward a little more here. I mean, there's a mystery example here, I wanna skip it. Uh, I wanna write this one called is palindrome. Tell me if a string has the same characters forwards as backwards, okay? So like, you know, race car, the R's, are the same, like if you turn it around, it still spells race car, right? So how is this self-similar? No loops, you're not allowed to use any loops. So again, the way I think about these problems are, I try to think about base cases, like what's a string that's really easy to answer whether it is the same forwards as backwards? So think about that. Another thing I think about is, can I do a small amount of the checking like you can even think of the loop version first. Just think if I had a loop, what would I do? Could I have my call do some small part of that and then sort of recursion the rest of it? Those are kind of the ways that I think about this problem. So if somebody I haven't called on yet, we have blue shirt lessons, yeah. How would you get started on this? I, uh, I would say that each, in each step I check the first character and the last one. And first and last? Yeah, and if they're similar, I'll pass the substring Great. And if I eventually get to only one character, so I'm done. Or, yeah. Yes, that's great. Uh, so check the end characters that start in the end. If they match, do the rest. And keep doing that with recursion. Eventually, I've whittled the string down to basically nothing, or maybe one character or, or, or something, right? That's great. I love it. Um, some of you might have been thinking, well, why don't I build a reversed version of the string and I see if they're equal to each other? That also works, but it's less self-similar. It's kind of hard to describe that process in a self-similar way. It's not a bad algorithm, it's just less recursive. So, um, okay, check the end characters. I could do that. Uh, I have a function here called ispalindrome. So, usually the, the code looks like if something, base case, right? And then else, recursive case. Sometimes, you know, it, it's weird because like I think you want to write code from the top to the bottom sometimes, but actually when I was learning recursion, I always found it easier to think about the recursive case. It's kind of what he said. Uh, look at the first letter and the last letter and then do stuff with the middle. That sounds kind of recursive to me. You know, uh, you did also talk about when to stop, which is kind of the base case, but that's okay. Um, you're sort of saying care first equals s bracket zero, care last equals s bracket s dot length minus one. And then if the first is equal to the last, that's good. So then I have to check the rest of the string. So like string middle equals s dot substring of one to s dot length minus two. The, that second parameter is how many characters. So that's how many characters I want. So if the first and the last are equal, I slice out the middle and then what? Recursion magic, right? See if the middle part is a, if, if the ends are a palindrome and what's between them is a palindrome, the whole string is a palindrome. So I should return whether it is a palindrome, what's in the middle. A lot of students who are just learning recursion, they delete the word return, they just say call is palindrome and pass middle. That's great, that's what you want, except that sub call is gonna go figure something out and it's gonna return something back to you and you need to return that back to whoever called you. So you hand off and you bring back and you have to think about these calls as being like a chain. It's like I handed off my M&M bowl when the M&M bowl comes back and I put my stuff in it, I don't just drop it on the floor, I gotta pass it back to the, you know what I mean? I gotta pass it to the person who gave the bowl to me. So yeah, uh, that's kind of your recursive case. So I guess another way of thinking of the base case is like when can I stop doing this, you know? I mean, one way to think of the base case is like if you ask me to compute something really simple, I can just do it. That's one way of thinking of it. But it's not always that the outside caller asks me to compute something simple. Sometimes it's that I've been doing this for a while and now I have reduced this string down to something that is simple. So what would be a place where I could stop? How, what do I put in the if here? If s.length is what? 
if it's, I, I guess it's, it's maybe unclear what do we do with an empty string, but let's say it's trivially true that you have a palindrome for an empty string or for a one letter string, because if you reverse those, they don't change to a different string. So if the length is less than or equal to one, return true. What about the string of two letters? Is this gonna work? We pull the first one off, we pull the last one off, we check if they're the same, the middle will be empty. So that, I think that works. Okay, um, let's go try it. I know we're out of time. This will be the last thing we do and then we'll get out of here. So let's do test is palindrome. And it's supposed to do, uh-oh. <laughs> I have that exception before. Sorry. Uh, I didn't put false? Ah, okay, wait, wait, wait. Yeah, so actually I have a, uh, I have a little bug here. So if the first and the last are the same, check the rest. If the first and the last are not the same, I'm not a palindrome, right? If the first and the last letters of me are not the same as each other, I don't even need to do a recursive call. I'm not a palindrome. Let's try again. Uh, it, yeah, it should have had a compiler warning. <laughs> hmm, I have to check on that later. It looks like it totally works, except for the capitalization issue, which you just do a lowercase call and then you're good on that. So I'm out of time. I gotta let you guys go. We're gonna practice lots more recursion on Wednesday. I'll see you then, thanks.